All right, I've started the recording. I'm going to um, introduce Chris Chambers now, and um, a few other folks might join us, but we'll welcome them in as they, as they log on. Um, Chris Chambers is a professor of neuroscience at Cardiff University, and he's been leading the Rich Report initiative um, for the past about four years now, approximately. Um, and what that is is a system of uh, uh, peer review before results are known in order to address uh, major biases in the scientific literature. Um, and he's going to go over the, the rationale for doing that and some, um, some of the uh, journals that are using this, some of the 50 or so journals that are using this initiative, um, and um, go through a series of um, questions geared towards early career researchers and how this can um, benefit your workflow. Um, at the end, I'll give a little bit of demonstration of creating a pre-registration on the OSF and just defining what that means and um, how that can work in a register report workflow. Uh, and um, at the end, we'll make sure to leave at least 15 minutes for, um, for questions and discussion. At any time, you should be able to uh, send a, a question to us and we'll see it. Um, and if there are questions or if there's um, clarification needed, uh, you know, make sure to let us know as we're going. Um, otherwise, we'll have um, more discussion at the end of the of the webinar. Um, and so, with that, Chris, take it away. Thanks, thanks, David, and um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. So, I'm going to, as David says, I'm going to talk about um, the registered reports format, and in particular, I want to discuss um, the the implications of this format for early career researchers, PhD students career postdocs, fellows, junior lecturers, and so on, people who are at that sort of formative stage of your career, as I imagine many of you who are watching this are, because this format's been very popular um, among younger scientists, and I think um, there are important issues to discuss around that and to highlight the benefits. So these are the three, um, the three points I want to cover um, today. First of all, what problem um, registered reports are trying to solve, how I'm going to talk about some of the problems that, you know, just, just quite briefly in science that we know about in terms of bias and reproducibility. Now I'm going to describe how registered reports actually work and take you through the mechanics of the process um, as it operates at journals. And then I'm going to finish by actually anticipating some of the, the questions that I get asked when I, um, when I give talks on registered reports. Um, for, um, for, you know, in various locations and in various scenarios. So just a little bit about me. David already kind of anticipated some of this, but um, so I'm a neuroscientist at Cardiff University. Um, I founded the Registered Reports Project together with others back in 2013 when we, we first launched it at the journal Cortex. And since then, um, I've taken up the section editor role for Registered Reports at the European Journal of Neuroscience and Royal Society, Open Science, and I've also helped to implement it at Nature Human Behaviour. And I'm also chair of the Registered Reports Committee at the Centre for Open Science, which is a, a collection of researchers who are um, trying to advance this format and advocate for it in different contexts. And you can, if you go to this link here, um, you can find lots and lots of information about registered reports. So um, just to put the, the problem into perspective to start with, we know that science has a big incentive problem that on the one hand, we would probably all agree that what's best for science as a whole is publishing high quality research regardless of the particular outcome that is achieved in a study. Um, and that would help to generate a knowledge base that we can rely on that's unbiased and it can help lead toward better theory and better applications. But on the other hand, what's best for me as an individual scientist is quite different. It's producing an awful lot of publishable results, a lot of good results, a lot of striking results, results that are seen as novel, attractive, making an important step forward um, and impressing reviewers and journal editors. And the problem in science is that um, when we put individual researchers under um, pressure to produce great results in order to advance their careers, achieve publications and, and get grant funding. They do precisely that, but they do so by short-circuiting the scientific method in various pernicious ways, which I'll just very quickly summarize. Um, so we know um, in, I'm just gonna take some um, statistics here from my field of psychology. We know that 
replication is extremely rare. And we know that just one in 1,000 papers reports an independent replication of a previously published experiment by researchers other than those who did the original experiment in the first place. We know that the statistical power in psychology is quite low with just a, a flip of a coin chance to detect medium-sized effects. And this problem has remained persistently from the 1960s through to present. We know that various forms of p-hacking are quite common. So p-hack by p-hacking, I mean selectively reporting analyses or outcomes um, that produce um, results that look better or are easier to publish. We know that researchers engage in different forms of p-hacking that um, even unconsciously undermine the scientific method at different stages. We have here um, p-hacking of um, uh, data acquisition where data are collected until p drops below 0.05, which of course violates frequent statistical philosophy. And we also have various forms of p-hacking at the analysis stage where data are analyzed in many different ways and only the most publishable outcomes are reported in the final product. Also, um, research is under a great deal of pressure to create narratives from their experiments that prove a hypothesis correct and show that the authors were correct in their suppositions in the first place. So we know that changing the hypothesis or hypothesizing after results are known is also a very common strategy with estimated prevalence rates as high as 90%. At the same time, we know that um, researchers um, are not very keen on sharing their data with other colleagues. Around 7 out of 10 psychologists will refuse to share data with, a, with a, a colleague, even when directly asked for it. And on top of all this, if it wasn't bad enough, um, the published literature exhibits another kind of bias altogether, in which only positive results really are published, and only 8% of published results in psychology are negative or inconclusive, by, which is interesting when you think about it, because it either means we already know what's true and so why bother doing experiments, or we have a massive problem um, with bias in the evidence base itself. So those problems look pretty bad, um, and I think it's important to reflect on why this is happening. And I've always believed that, in fact, the real root cause of all of this is because we place, as scientists, um, in different, in different you know, parts of the job, we place far too much importance on the results of the experiments we conduct in terms of determining outcomes and not enough on the processes that produce those results. And this is just human nature in many respects because science um, depends on results. Results make our jobs exciting and worth doing. But judging the quality of the science and the scientists themselves according to those results is the classic definition of a soft science. And when I talk to my colleagues and friends who are in physics or chemistry, this is what they would say defines a soft science. When you choose what should get published based upon the results of the experiment rather than the actual quality of the experiment itself. Now the good news is that I think we can fix this uh, and it requires adopting a, a, a rather different philosophy to the one that dominates um, the life and social sciences at the moment. And the philosophy is simply this, that when it comes to hypothesis testing, what gives it its scientific value is the question that it asks, and the quality of the method that it uses, but never the result that is produced from the combination of those two things. So really, what's important is, is the question that I'm asking important to answer? How important is that answer? And how robust, how rigorous, how um, um, well-controlled is the method that I'm using? But the result that is produced should be completely irrelevant in determining uh, the value of hypothesis testing. Now, if you accept that philosophy, then it makes sense that editorial decisions at journals should be blind to results. There's no possible benefit for a journal editor or a reviewer knowing something that does not inform them about the quality of the experiment that they're assessing. All it can do, in, in fact, is introduce bias, which, of course, we know is very common. So based on this logic, we, we've argued that, in fact, editorial decisions should be as blind as possible to results in order to... Present, uh, prevent ourselves from fooling ourselves into um, prioritizing the publication of, of experiments that have more attractive results over those that have unattractive results when the methodological and theoretical quality of the work is the same in each case. And it's based on this logic that registered reports really emerged. So back in 2013, we first launched this at the journal Cortex. And there are four central pillars 
of this um, publication model. The first is that researchers decide their hypotheses, their experimental procedures, and their primary analyses before they commence data collection. Part of the peer review process takes place at this point before experiments are conducted based on a peer review of basically an introduction and a method section. If you pass this stage of review, publication is virtually guaranteed regardless of the outcomes of the work. And original studies and high value replications are welcome as part of the initiative. So I'll now talk about how this um, works in practice. So the way it works is that authors submit a stage one manuscript, which includes an introduction, proposed methods and analyses, and pilot data where applicable. This goes out to stage one peer review, where reviewers are um, assessing the manuscript according to various criteria, such as are the hypotheses well-founded? Are they based on a strong and coherent theoretical rationale? Are the methods and the proposed analyses that are in that um, protocol feasible and are they sufficiently detailed to provide um, a recipe essentially that other researchers could replicate without requiring um, additional contact with the authors, without requiring them to pick up the phone and ask what was the secret source, what was the magic potion and you getting this, re this result. And is the study well powered? So this is a crucial criteria at many of the journals including Cortex where we set um, a minimal statistical power level of 90% for all hypothesis tests. And finally, have the authors included sufficient positive controls to confirm that the, that the study will provide a fair test? So have they included sufficient quality checks, robustness checks, positive controls, um, uh, various other forms of checks like the absence of flaw and ceiling effects in data? Have they pre-specified what conditions must be in place in order for the outcomes of the main hypothesis tests to be interpretable, which is of course a, a key element of good study design. So these are go out to review and um, this, the protocol goes out to review at this point. And if the reviews that come back are positive, and this usually follows at least one round of revision, then the journal offers what we call in principle acceptance or IPA, which um, is regardless of study outcome. So the journal basically provisionally accepts this paper before the results exist and before the results are known. Now at this point at Cortex, the protocol is not published, it's held in reserve by the journal, but authors can of course freely publish it themselves on the open science framework or in any other repository as they choose. So now with the provisional acceptance um, um, under their belt, authors can go away and do their research as planned. And when they're finished, they resubmit what we call a stage two manuscript, which includes the introduction and the methods from the original stage one submission, which are virtually unchanged except for any necessary changes in the tense of the language and other very minor, um, um, uh, you know, syntactical or grammatic changes. It also includes a results section, but crucially, unlike a normal um, manuscript, the results section is divided into two different subsections. The first reports the outcome of any registered confirmatory analyses. So these are the analyses that were pre-specified and approved as part of the stage one review. And it also includes um, ad any additional uh, exploratory analyses that the authors might have thought of along the way, um, but which were not pre-registered in that stage one submission. So this could be, you know, a new analysis technique was developed in the meantime, or a serendipitous finding in a subgroup was, was observed in the data. Anything can be reported, provided of course it passes peer review and it's legitimate and well conducted, but any, in theory, any exploratory analysis can be reported. There's no barriers on exploration. It's simply that those exploratory analyses are reported in a, in a separate part of the results section. The manuscript also includes a discussion section, of course, for interpret interpreting those results. And as part of the initiative of Cortex, authors are also asked to deposit their data in a public archive so that it can be verified and reused by other researchers. So this goes out to stage two peer review, where now um, it goes back to the same reviewers, and this time they're answering a different set of questions. Um, did the authors follow the protocol that was approved at stage one? This is obviously a crucial element. Did the positive control succeed? So did any pre-specified outcome neutral tests, positive controls, quality checks, etc., pass? And are the conclusions justified by the data as presented? 
And if the manuscript passes um, all of these, if the answer to all of these questions is yes, then the manuscript is published. So I'll just emphasize a few points here. What doesn't matter really when assessing a registered report is, is just as important to note as what does matter. None of these things determine whether or not a manuscript will be published at stage two. So it doesn't matter whether the hypothesis is supported. It doesn't matter whether the results are statistically significant. It doesn't matter whether the results are considered novel or impactful by reviewers or editors. In fact, editors are prevented in policy from allowing even the suggestion of such interpretations to influence the editorial decision. So as an editor, my hands are absolutely tied in this respect. So I'll just show you a couple of published examples um, of registered reports at Cortex. Um, so we have here on the left of the screen uh, three examples. Um, one was a neuropharmacological study using MEG, another was a multi-site replication of a behavioral effect, and another one was an EEG study of mirror neurons. Um, one point to note is that, like most of the registered reports we see, these were um, led um, or at least um, uh, heavily contributed to by early career researchers. Um, and this is uh, an ongoing theme we're seeing with registered reports, that it's very popular with the, with the uh, young scientific community. And you can see, if you, if you navigate down to the link here, um, you can read all the first six um, registered reports at Cortex in our virtual special issue. And you can also find other special issues of registered reports at Social Psychology and many ongoing registered reports of perspectives on psychological science. So I'll just quickly emphasize what I see as the three main categories of benefit in terms of science for this format. So first of all, in my opinion, these are amongst the most reproducible studies um, published in science today. So they, for two main reasons. The first is that they contain a highly detailed method section, much more detailed than in the normal paper, which allows the methods themselves to be more repeatable, more easily repeatable by other researchers. And secondly, because of the um, power requirement of 90%, the statistical power of registered reports is much higher um, than um, for typical papers. And sample sizes are usually around two to three times above the normal um, level. These papers, these registered reports are also extremely transparent. Um, they by necessity contain open data and materials. And they're transparent in another way, I think, which is very important, which is that the, the outcomes of the confirmatory hypothesis-driven analyses are clearly and transparently distinguished from the outcomes of any additional exploratory analyses, which really helps strengthen the inferential value of both forms of investigation. And finally, they're, in my opinion, amongst the most credible publications in science because there's no publication bias because the editorial decision, the main editorial decision is made before results are known, so it's impossible for the outcomes of the research to influence the decision to publish. There's no hindsight bias because authors can't change their hypotheses or even refine their hypotheses after they see their data. And there's no selective reporting because authors can't um, uh, selectively report analyses based on the outcome because all of the main confirmatory analyses are pre-specified in the protocol. So back in 2013, we decided to offer this format um, in one journal, but we also decided to um, push for more journals to offer it across science. So Marcus Manafo and I and more than 80 um, members of journal editorial boards called for all journals in the life sciences to offer registered reports. Not as the only way to publish, not, not some kind of mandatory requirement, but as a universal option that scientists should always have to consider when choosing how to conduct their research and how to publish it. And since then, we've seen the format taken up by 48 journals at current count, um, including a mixture of permanent adopters and journals that have um, launched the format um, via a special issue. And one of the interesting aspects of all of this is the, the sort of breadth of the, um, of the uptake across different fields. So we started off in Cortex, and we've seen it go to all kinds of areas in health psychology, developmental psychology, um, psychophysiology, we've seen it move into political science. Um, we've seen the adoption by um, even interesting areas that I didn't even know existed, like financial studies um, and a, you know, journal of accounting research. So areas where um, uh, issues of bias essentially have been around for a long time 
and, and the journals are seeing this as an opportunity to incentivize a less biased and perhaps more robust way of doing hypothesis-driven science. I'll just emphasize a couple of, um, I'll draw your attention to a couple of um, the adopting journals in particular. Registered reports first, first of all at Royal Society Open Science, which is notable because the format here is, is um, offered across all STEM subjects from astrophysics all the way through to you know, biology, life sciences, and all the way through to psychology. So this is notable for being launched across over 200 different sciences, which is a fascinating way of um, uh, doing this because you get to see the uptake within different areas. So we're seeing submissions coming in from computer science and plant biology and psychology and all, and we're seeing interest in all these different areas. So that's a very interesting um, test of the model. And it's also a really nice um, journal because it's completely open access. Um, it has open peer review and it has no um, article processing charge. So it's a really kind of ideal venue for maximizing the transparency of the registered reports process itself. And the second journal I'll, I'll point out, which may be of particular interest um, to early career researchers, is uh, Nature Human Behavior, which launched registered reports in February. Um, again, across quite a wide, wide range of um, disciplines from neuroscience and psychology and psychiatry, but all the way through to areas that traditionally haven't really um, um, been that invested in the reproducibility discussions, you know, humanities subjects like anthropology and sociology, public policy. It's very, it'd be very interesting to see the kind of uptake we get within those individual specialisations. And just to draw your attention to some of the other specialist journals that are now offering registered reports, of course, Cortex, as I mentioned earlier, but we've also seen recent adoption by behavioural neuroscience, uh, attention, perception and psychophysics, which was one of the earlier adopters, the European Journal of Neuroscience, so the official journal of FENS, comprehensive results in social psychology, which is the only journal at the moment that has been created specially to publish only registered reports. So this journal um, publishes every article that appears in this journal is a registered report, memory. Um, and so there's many other journals. And if you navigate to our um, central repository, you can find a full list of those journals and I'll, I'll um, return to that later. So I'll just finish by um, uh, anticipating some of the frequently asked questions that um, registered reports raises in audiences of early career researchers um, in the hope that it, maybe it can address some questions that are on your mind. Um, and I'm sure you'll have other questions as well, which we can also um, help answer at the end. So the first um, question I often get is whether registered reports are suitable for my field. How do I know whether this format would benefit my area of science? And I think the simple answer really is that it's applicable to any field engaged in hypothesis-driven research where at least one or more of the following problems occur. So publication bias, various forms of significance chasing or p-hacking, various forms of hindsight bias, such as retrofitting a hypothesis onto unexpected results, low statistical power or lack of replication. If any of these problems apply and your area um, is one in which people publish hypothesis-driven studies, then um, this format has the potential to benefit the reproducibility of that field. On the other hand, it's not applicable for everything and it shouldn't be um, um, advertised as a, as a cure-all for science. It's not appropriate for, in my opinion, for purely exploratory science, science where there's no hypothesis testing, where um, the purpose is perhaps to generate hypotheses from large data sets rather than to test them. And it's generally not really appropriate either for methods development where an approach is being taken to perhaps refine a, a technique without any clear hypothesis moving from one stage to the next. So really the, the, the essence of this format, the value that it derives is from hypothesis driven science. Are registered reports suitable for me as an early career researcher? Um, yes, in, in, my, in my opinion they are and the evidence from the submissions we're getting suggests that this is indeed the case. They send a signal that you're a scientist that cares about transparency and reproducibility, not just playing the game, as we say, but seeking to make real discoveries. And there's no reason for this quest for understanding nature and truth to trade off against the incentive structure in science. By pursuing this route, you can still publish in prestigious journals offered by Royal Society, APA, the Nature Group, etc. Um, but you can do so in a way that um, sends a signal 
that you care about discovering something true rather than manufacturing stories that will um, um, uh, that reviewers and editors will find attractive and interesting. And also there's perhaps a more pragmatic benefit, which is when you're going for postdoctoral positions, it's, it's worthwhile um, thinking about how your CV will look if you're coming to the end of a PhD. Um, it's very common um, for finishing graduate students to list their, their CVs with lots of in preparation or submitted papers. Um, but in fact, um, if you pursue some, at least some registered reports, then your CV at that end point, even if you haven't completely finished writing up the final end stage of the registered report, you will still have um, more to say about the work that is in progress. So for example, a paper might say provisionally accepted at journal um, rather than in preparation or submitted. So personally speaking as PI myself, if I see a, a CV with a provisionally accepted registered report, I know that that's a paper that actually exists and has gone through peer review Whereas when I see in preparation or submitted, there's always this question in my mind as to how far that work has really progressed and if, in fact, if that work exists at all. What is the acceptance rate um, for registered reports? So at Cortex, our standard um, rejection rate for unregistered normal research articles, so not registered reports, is 90%. So nine out of 10 standard research reports get rejected for various reasons. But for registered reports, what's very interesting is that that flips around. So actually, in fact, only 10% of the submissions that pass the initial editorial triage and so therefore proceed to in-depth peer review at stage one, only 10% of those are rejected. And that's not because we set uh, a lower bar for quality or that we're more lenient in any respect. It's simply um, that before the research is conducted, there's an opportunity for the authors to um, resolve criticisms and concerns raised by reviewers before they become blocks to publication. So it's easier to fix a, a flaw in a procedure or to optimize an analysis before that procedure or that analysis is in fact being conducted. And because of this, um, we see a much lower rejection rate for papers that proceed through the stage one review process. And at stage two, you might be wondering, well, what's the chances of getting rejected after my results are in? And it's very low because the reviewers at that point are not assessing papers according to the traditional criteria. They're simply assessing, um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the very basic aspects of, you know, is the, were the positive control successful? Does the protocol um, uh, followed closely? Are the conclusions based on the evidence? And for this reason, the rejection rate at stage two is currently 0% across all the journals that currently offer registered reports. How long does the review process take? At Cortex, it's around nine weeks for each of the rounds, so nine weeks to complete stage one and nine weeks to complete stage two. This typically includes at least one, but up to three rounds of review. The most we've had is four, the average is about two. Um, this doesn't include the time taken for authors to revise their manuscripts. So sometimes authors revise their manuscripts very quickly and they come back within days. Other times we've had um, authors take months to, to adjust their papers and, and return them. Um, but if you take away that time, then uh, it's about nine weeks to from the moment you submit um, your stage one manuscripts to achieving an initial stage one decision. What happens if I need to change something about my experimental procedures after they are provisionally accepted? Are you forbidden from making even the most trivial change to your protocol? No, you're not. So minor changes are absolutely fine and they're very common. This can happen when things like um, equipment breaks or other very small changes in procedures are required. All that, have, all that we require is that these are um, communicated to the editorial board as soon as they become known to the authors. So for example, during the research. And in those cases, minor, minor deviations are simply footnoted in the eventual stage two manuscript as protocol deviations. Major changes um, are more serious. So authors who perhaps want to change their data exclusion criteria or something very major about their pre-registered analyses. In those cases, if they're too significant, then that would require withdrawal of a stage one submission and possible re-review. We haven't had a case of that occurring to date. So this is most likely a rare event, but there, there will be a line that needs to be drawn by the editors between minor and major changes. And that's ultimately for each editorial board to decide. But the point I really want to make is that deviations that are minor, that are part of the normal process of doing a, a, an experiment are perfectly fine. Some of my analyses will depend on the results. So how can I pre-register each step in detail? So for example, um, whether a, a parametric or non-parametric test is used 
in an experiment would depend on the distribution of the data that's obtained. How can you know this in advance? Does this does pre-registration require you to really know everything about your data before you pre-register your analyses? And the answer is it doesn't. So pre-registration doesn't require each decision to be specified, only the decision tree. So authors are welcome to pre-register contingencies or rules for future decisions, essentially if-then statements. So if my data is distributed this way, then I'll do this kind of test. If it's distributed that way, I'll do that kind of test. There, there, are, there are various ways that um, the most likely possible um, distributions or contingencies can be anticipated. And then um, those contingencies themselves are pre-registered rather than researchers being committed to a particular hardwired approach. I have access to an existing data set that I haven't yet analyzed. Can I submit this as a registered report? The answer is that some journals you can, some journals you can't. So at Cortex or Nature Human Behavior, for example, um, secondary registered reports are not accepted, but at other journals they are. So at the European Journal of Neuroscience, where I'm one of the section editors, we have decided to offer this um, format um, as a way of opening up registered reports and expanding its potential utility across science. Um, the only requirement is that authors haven't previously observed or analysed that data set before they, um, before they propose the analysis on it. And that's in order to prevent overfitting and forms of bias from creeping back into the process. And if you want to see which journals currently offer that amongst other features, you can navigate to our Registered Reports Journal Features page, which um, you can find on the Centre for Open Science Registered Reports Hub. And in particular, um, column seven there shows which journals offer um, analyses of existing data sets or secondary registered reports. How do registered reports support replication studies is a very common question that I get. A lot of early career scientists are interested in doing replications, um, but they're um, not able to, and uh, they find that there are a lot of systemic barriers to doing so. And this is true because, I mean, generally in science, uh, a whole range of circumstances conspire to tell us that it's not worth bothering investing the time and the energy into doing direct or close replications. For one thing, the method sections in original research are often too vague to allow precise replication. There are too many gaps um, and too much secret knowledge, essentially, which, which prevents us from just using the paper as a guide. Um, the chronic lack of power in novel research means that replications often need very large sample sizes, which further reduces their feasibility. On top of that, there's a kind of social problem, which is that in, in some areas, such as psychology, trying to repeat someone else's experiment can sometimes be perceived as an act of aggression. And, um, and people who do replications can face um, accusations of bullying and so on, as we've seen in recent years. Even if you pass all of those barriers, um, you'll find it very difficult normally to publish a replication study because motivated reasoning by the reviewers stops this from happening. If you, if you um, successfully replicate the target study, then editors and reviewers will say that this adds nothing, that we already knew this. And if you don't replicate, if you fail to replicate, then at least some of the reviewers who are likely to be authors of the original work will try to stop publication because they will find, they'll go through your methods with a fine tooth comb and they'll find some deviation from their original um, method, which I'm sure they can use to argue that you did something different and that's why you've got different results. So it can be very difficult to um, overcome this barrier of motivated reasoning. And on top of all of this, there are some journals, which there are many journals, which not only prioritize novelty, but also um, prohibit replications themselves. And they see them as unpublishable and unworthy of attention. Registered reports solve all of these problems um, because you can have your, for one thing, they're, they're explicitly invited for replication studies, but you avoid all of these problems with motivated reasoning and vague method sections and so on by having your replication experiment reviewed before you invest the resources into doing the study. And you can also um, potentially involve the original authors in the peer review of your protocol in cases where the methods that they have provided are insufficiently precise to enable you to just use their paper. And by doing the, by breaking up the, re the review process into these two stages, we prevent this motivated reasoning. It's not possible for um, the reviewers to shift the goalposts after results are in. Once they sign off at stage one, they're as committed as you are to the results, regardless of how they turn out. Another question I often get is um, how well registered reports have been cited. Um, and it's an early initiative, so we don't have a lot of data on this, but we can say so far at Cortex, 
that they're, they're cited about 10 to 15 percent above um, the impact factor per, per year. So the impact factor of cortex being around four is about 10 to 15 percent higher than that impact factor. I'm not a big fan of impact factors, I must admit. I think they can be very limited value in general. But these, insofar as these statistics matter, um, we have evidence so far that registered reports are reasonably well cited and certainly are cited consistently with the impact factor of the journal, perhaps a little bit higher than the impact factor of the journal, which perhaps isn't surprising when you think about it, given that they are large studies, they are um, robust studies, and they're very transparent studies. So if science is really this process of, of, of seeking truth, then in fact registered reports should be amongst the highest cited. I have no idea what effect size to expect in my experiment, so how can I do a power analysis as part of stage one? It's a very common question, not just from early career scientists, but from, from all kinds of researchers at all stages. Um, usually there is some related literature. In fact, um, I think we have a tendency in my area at least to overestimate the novelty of every experiment that we do. We, every, we think every experiment is a kind of unique and beautiful snowflake that's not unlike anything that's ever come before, but in fact, I think there usually is related literature, but even if not, um, you can always specify a minimal effect size of theoretical interest or of clinical significance or whatever that barrier that, um, that criterion is, and you can power your study to detect an effect of that size. Um, if even a minimal effect size of interest is uncertain, and there are some options, you can adopt an orthodox, orthodox statistical approach where you correct for peaking, so <coughs> you, correct, you collect data sequentially um, and perform frequentist tests as you go, but you correct sequentially at each stage. And this is, Daniel Larkins has um, uh, published a really nice method for doing this, which preserves high power in um, study design. Or you can go Bayesian and you can um, set a prior distribution of possible effect sizes and sample continuously until a Bayes factor um, favors one hypothesis over another. And you can also include pilot results within stage one submissions in order to help inform effect size estimations and um, to help contribute to the, the, the evidence base that you're using to um, motivate your power analysis. Another question I often get is whether reviewers could steal ideas at the pre-registration stage and then run those, um, run those uh, protocols faster perhaps than the, the original authors. Uh, before I answer this, I should just point out, you know, scooping is very rare, and I, there are very few cases of it, really properly documented cases of it happening. But nevertheless, we recognize that this is a real concern, so there are a few safeguards that we've built in. For one thing, the, it's important to remember that the protocol isn't published when you get your stage one submission accepted provisionally. It's held in reserve by the journal, and the authors can choose to self-publish it if they wish on the open science framework, but the protocol itself is really only seen by a handful of people, the editors and the reviewers. Even if you had a, an unscrupulous reviewer that went away and decided you had such an amazing idea that they, would, they wanted to run the experiment themselves, it's important to note that they couldn't influence whether or not your paper is eventually accepted because novelty of the approach, once you get to the provisional acceptance stage, is irrelevant in um, determining the final publication decision. And there's another little um, feature that we built in to help um, authors um, help to generate confidence in authors about this issue, which is that when the final registered report is published, at the top of the paper, in addition to the manuscript received date, manuscript accepted date, and so on, we always publish the protocol received date. So the date, the very, the very first date that the journal saw that stage one protocol. And this is so that authors, if necessary, could always show that their idea came before any unscrupulous reviewer went off and ran their experiment faster than they could. And I think it's important not to, you know, to overblow this concern because we have so many different forums in science where we present ideas to each other and openness is something that we, we treasure really when we write grant applications or we give conference presentations, seminars, discussions and so on. We often present ideas for research that is yet to be completed and seeking feedback is an important part of science. So I don't really see that registered reports raise any additional concerns on top of the existing processes that we have. Registered reports seem limited to single studies. What if I want to publish a sequence of experiments? Well, this is um, a feature that we offer at um, many of the registered report journals like Cortex and Nature Human Behavior. So we offer sequential registrations. So what authors can do is they can add studies iteratively at stage one. So you pre-register your first experiment, 
get your results, write up your stage two submission, and then you have a choice. You can either publish the um, paper at that point, or you can lock it in, lock it in stone essentially, and then pre-register the next experiment. And if it's a very similar design, then we can pursue a fast track review process and then proceed and you can bolt on experiments one by one in this manner. So with each cycle that you go through, the previous version of the paper, that accepted version, is guaranteed to be published so you can securely add experiments as you go. There's another way that you can also um, pursue sequential experiments and that is to use the registered report as the kind of um, the, uh, the finale of a series of preliminary experiments. And we see this quite often with registered reports where authors will submit say one, two or three preliminary experiments and then this all goes into their stage one submission and they propose a protocol for a fourth experiment which kind of seals the deal, a big pre-registered study which is usually designed to try and resolve some kind of question or some res uncertainty that has been um, generated from the, pr the previous experiments. This is a really nice model I think for a registered report where the confirmatory experiment is used to provide a kind of finale to the original experiments. And finally, perhaps the, the biggest question I get, and the one, the one that I think is perhaps the toughest to answer, is how do I convince my supervisor or principal investigator to even try this? And this is a real challenge. So this, this is, I don't have a good answer to this. This can be challenging, and it really depends what kind of PI you have. If, you, if your PI is um, someone who maintains a large file drawer and someone who is promoting a brand, essentially, or has a really strong investment in a particular theory or a particular direction of their work, you may find it difficult to convince them to even attempt um, uh, registered reports or to allow you to pursue this. Because in a lab where um, the information that is published is tightly regulated, a registered report can be a risk to a, to a lab's narrative and a lab's brand if the results of that registered report happen to disagree with the brand that the lab is promoting. So I think the, the first step is really to raise the issue with your PI and you'll, you'll learn something I think quite informative about the kind of scientist your PI is from how they react to the suggestion of registered reports. Whether they say, you know, this is, this, is a, this, is an, this is an interesting idea and maybe we should give this a try versus absolutely not. Um, there's no way we could um, embrace a method where we commit to publishing um, a paper regardless of how the results turn out. So you'll learn something useful about your principal investigator from how they react to the suggestion. But I'd say regardless of how they react, you can make a number of quite strong arguments for trying this out and perhaps persuading them um, to adopt this or at least attempt to, um, as an experiment even, within, within a, a lab to, to give it a go. So first of all, I'd say you can explain the wider community benefits of this format um, to reproducibility in the field. And you can explain the potential benefits for your career in signposting your commitment to transparency and reproducibility and doing high powered, rigorous, deductive science. And this is always a strength when you're um, demonstrating the scientific contribution of your work. Also, there's a potential um, argument that can be made and a benefit for PIs that in, if they're working in a really competitive or controversial field, the registered report format can be very helpful for um, providing much needed clarity and avoiding stonewalling. So sometimes what happens in highly competitive areas is that rivals, rival labs or rival researchers will reject papers because the results disagree with their particular theoretical bent. But with a registered report, those rivals no longer have the opportunity to do that. So there's a benefit potentially for um, PIs who are very strategic in their approach in adopting this format as a way of publishing results which they would otherwise find very difficult because they disagree with, others, with other scientists' particular agendas. And you can also argue that, that the, um, the format is being offered by an increasing number of major journals with the number of journals rising all the time. And as we go forward with, it, with this initiative, and, and the way this initi initiative kind of, the way it's situated within the, this kind of continuum of various initiatives going on, um, transparency is something that is becoming increasingly prominent in um, the eyes of funders, institutions, journals, um, science generally. And this is only going to increase in prominence over time. Open science is going to be the future. So you can make, certainly make an argument with a PI or a supervisor that it's an important part of your training and an important part of perhaps their own career that they start thinking about transparency and ways of getting ahead of the boat a little bit 
So it's better to adopt these sorts of initiatives before they're necessary or before the bar is raised too much so that by the time funders are saying, you know what, I would like you to do more pre-registration or I would like you to do more open data, you will be prepared for that and you'll have the necessary training and experience to do that yourself. So I'll just finish by pointing out um, the Registered Reports Information Hub. So this is a page that David and I maintain at the Centre for Open Science. There's lots of great information on here. We've got a, um, a list of all the participating journals with links to all of their individual policies and their author guidelines. Um, and so you can find all of this in one location. Um, and that list is continually growing, so check back um, now and again and, and consider following us on Twitter because we always announce when new joint journals um, adopt registered reports. Um, you can find more details about the workflow of registered reports and hear more details than I've had time to discuss today. You can also find um, various other kinds of sources of information. There's, you can find information about new registered reports funding models that we're developing where we work in partnership with funders um, to um, create a registered reports model that, that doubles as a grant application. And you can find an extensive list of frequently asked questions as well. Um, questions that, um, again, I haven't had time to address in full. So I will leave it at that for now, and either we can um, move on to David's discussion of, of pre-registration generally, or um, I can take any questions that come to mind. So thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm going to give about two points and then we'll open it up for questions. So let me just steal Chris's screen, um, screen here. Put you off. Go to my messy desktop here. All right, I just wanted to give one um, little distinction um, about how we talk about pre-registration and how it fits into the register reports workflow. Um, and then I'll give an example workflow where you can include pre-registration by yourself and give you a link to um, create that pre-registration on the open science framework. Um, so the pre-registration itself is that time-stamped read-only version of your research plan. Um, and if it includes the complete analysis plan, it can start to address a lot of the issues that Chris was talking about, about um, um, you know, p-hacking, um, unreported flexibility in data analysis, um, hypothesizing after results are known. Um, but then when that um, research plan is um, subjected to peer review before results are known, then it becomes part of that complete registered report format that Chris has been talking about. Um, and so I want to give a couple of examples of when you can use a pre-registration, hopefully in um, a series of studies leading up to um, a submission to a registered report um, or by itself um, for publication eventually in a journal um, that doesn't necessarily, um, that might not necessarily um, be implementing registered reports. So let me show that two example workflows here. Sorry about that. Um, one example of a workflow is um, when you've got that strong theory driven a priori expectation, you create the pre registration with the research plans, the specific hypotheses that you're going to test the variables you're going to collect, and how you're going to analyze the data to make an inference. You collect the data set um, after completing the pre-registration, specify those confirmatory, um, or conduct those pre-specified confirmatory tests, and then afterwards, go to town on the data set, um, look for any sort of unexpected trend, look for the effect of various um, covariates or differences between populations that weren't necessarily um, expected ahead of time, um, and those unexpected trends, um, those, that data exploration that can lead to really new um, discoveries um, are what's appropriate to be used in um, a next round of hypothesis testing research. So create a new registration with those unexpected trends um, for your next round of data collection. If you don't have the luxury of doing that, multiple rounds of data collection with the type of work you're using. Um, uh, another example to uh, have your cake and eat it too, so to speak, is when you're starting work um, with very few, a much more exploratory way. You have very few exploratory, um, you have very few pre-specified um, expectations for how there will be differences or trends or, um, or, or significant results possibly in the data set. 
So you, you create a fairly vague pre-registration, saying you're just trying to collect this and, and look for some um, trends in the data set. You collect the data, and then you split it in half, um, or some other ratio if you want. Um, and with uh, one set of the data set, you, um, you keep it secret, keep it safe, don't look at it. Um, but with the other set of the data set that you're opening up, you're using that um, opened up data set for um, discovery, for looking for something that you didn't necessarily necessarily expect ahead of time. Then when you have something that you think is um, exciting, worth sharing, worth um, or really worth putting to a stronger test, um, you then create a new pre-registration with that test that you just um, conducted in order to find that um, tantalizing preliminary result. And you create a pre-registration with that test and um, use that as the basis for your confirmatory research um, after creating pre-registration with that um, that new analysis that you just recently discovered. Um, you don't have to collect new data at that point. You um, just open up the data set that you would had on reserve and had it analyzed up to that point. And that can be the basis for confirmatory hypothesis testing. I want to show one example on the open science framework of how to um, do this. And so um, cos.io slash pre-reg is the page where you can um, learn a little bit about what creating a pre-registration um, can entail. And that brings you into the open science framework where after logging in, you'll have choices to start a new pre-registration or if you have projects already on the OSF, you can um, continue working on one that you already have. And the purpose of this form is to lead somebody through the series of questions that need to be answered in order to um, create a complete registration with a fully specified analysis plan. So it'll lead you through the research questions, hypotheses that you need to specify, what you're going to do to collect the data, the degree to which any um, data set may or may not be um, exist already. I'll ask you about the um, variables if it's an experiment, um, what variables you're gonna manipulate. Um, about a third of the pre-registrations we see coming in are observational studies, um, so they don't have any manipulated variables, so this type of work is appropriate for um, observational studies or even meta-analyses. Um, if you're going to combine variables into a complex index, you can specify how that will happen. Um, skipping ahead, the most detailed part of the pre-registration is the analysis plan, and this is where people will tend to spend the most amount of time, because these are the types of questions that do have to be answered in any um, publication, but are often left until later after data collection. But what we're asking here is to, you know, ahead of time specify exactly how that analysis will happen, um, if any transformations are necessary, if any follow-up tests um, from the result of your omnibus um, hypothesis test or models, how you're going to make an inference. Pre-registration is a great way to justify a, a one-tailed test, which is um, otherwise often um, almost unpublishable because your viewers will ask you, did you really specify that direction beforehand? And a pre-registration is a great way to increase power um, by specifying in advance um, your one-tailed directional hypotheses. Um, at the end of this form, you'll have the option to review what it looks like. And you'll have two options at the end. You can just create a pre-registration um, right away. Um, but the pre-registration challenge is an education campaign where we're incentivizing you to, to try this process out. Um, so if you um, submitted for review, what we're doing right here is just taking a quick look about what the, making sure that the pre-registrations are a fully specified analysis plan. And publications resulting from these pre-registrations are eligible for $1,000 prizes. So we have 1,000 of these $1,000 prizes to give out. So um, take a look at that. Every registration, every any registration on the OSF can be made public immediately, or you can enter into embargo for up to four years. Um, that's what I do. Um, and then what happens then is we'll take a look at it, get back to you within one or two days. Um, about half of them we ask for slight revisions, and then uh, a pre-registration is created on the OSF where you can um, send that. Um, um, for review in a, in a normal submission to, uh, to a journal for peer review after results are known, or more ideally, use this as part of your um, submission to a, a registered report, or after getting in principle acceptance from a journal, um, include that information on the OSF in a pre-registration. 
And with that, I'm going to uh, stop talking finally and leave it open for questions. So I'm just going to pull up the Q&A window. Feel free to uh, use the chat window. Or there's a Q&A panel that should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you um, can submit questions either way. Emma just asked, can you recommend some reading on effect size and power? Um, Chris, do you have any off the top mm. of your head? Um, yeah, so there's lots of great stuff on this. Um, there's a great paper by Daniel Larkins on um, how to calculate effect sizes that he published in Frontiers. Um, let me just see if I can dig it out here. Here it is. I'll put it through on, um, on the chat window. You see here. This is a really great paper for effect sizes. Um, there's been lots of great papers written on about power. Um, perhaps the one that um, I think is really important to consider is um, a review of power um, by Kate Button called Power Failure in um, Neuroscience. Um, and I'll just pop that link through as well. It's really, it depends, I guess, which area you work in. But um, the issues that they raise seem to be quite common to many different areas of science, at least the life sciences. And it's worth a read about the the, the consequences of low power um, for not only false negatives, but also for false positives. Um, and um, for software um, for doing power analysis, um, G-Power is really good and really easy, um, simple program to use. And there are other programs as well. And if you do fMRI, there are now, um, for example, special things like NeuroPower tools and fMRIPower.org, which are also quite useful. Um, another question. I'm new to pre-registering studies, and I'm wondering if there's any benefit to pre-registering a study on OSF if I don't go through the journal's pre-registration process. For example, I'm working on a model that I have a pilot study for. I publish my method, hypotheses on OSF, and I'm collecting data now. How can I leverage that pre-registration with a submission to a journal? Um, I think Chris and I will yeah. both answer that. Um, so, um, the advantage of, um, so the advantage of pre-registering, even if you don't go through a registered reports process, is that um, if you find amazing results, you'll be able to prove to reviewers that you didn't p-hack. This is an argument that I think Leif Nelson first made some years ago. And he said, you know, it's, I have a purely selfish motivation to pre-register, which is that I want to be able to demonstrate that I predicted my results, rather than having to um, navigate through the uncertainty of reviewers, perhaps questioning to what extent your results or your hypotheses were cherry-picked out of unexpected parts of your data. So pre the transparency that pre-registration gives you also kind of um, insulates you against um, various criticisms from reviewers that can make it difficult to publish. And the second thing I would say is that um, even if you're not able to use the registered reports route, one of the benefits of pre-registering is that you can um, earn the pre-registered badge that some journals like Psych Science are offering and other journals, and an increasing number of journals are offering, where um, having demonstrated a time-stamped um, pre-registered plan, um, you get this little um, kite mark appearing at the top of your article, which adds a further, um, further signpost, you know, credibility and transparency. And of course, you're also eligible for the, the pre-reg challenge that David mentioned earlier, which is, you know, always nice. Everyone needs $1,000, don't they? It's a nice little uh, incentive grabber. I'm just gonna show you what those, um badges look like on psych science. So every issue now, they've been issuing these badges for the past um, several years. And here's uh, two triple badgers right in a row. So these are just little visual indicators that um, these two studies have an open data set. They're openly sharing their materials in a persistent repository. Um, and they're citing a pre-registration. So, so these two studies um, did not undergo peer review before results are known. Um, but they, they are citing that per registration showing that um, that their analyses were specified before seeing the data set, before collecting the data probably. Um, let's see, a question here in the Q&A window. What if the editors of the most common journals in my field do not want to implement registered reports? 
Um, and they might cite several reasons, maybe because they think it gets too much work to the editors and reviewers, or because they think it's impossible for researchers to plan methods and analyses in advance, um, even though the field is hypothesis driven. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, the first thing I would say there is um, let email me or David and let us know which journals you want, because we have a pretty good hit rate now of convincing journals to adopt this. There are a lot of reasons why it is in um, the interests of journals to offer registered reports. And in fact, if you look on the YouTube page, um, you'll find a previous webinar I did which was geared toward journal editors. And you can find some of the some arguments for why they should adopt it. So we're getting pretty good at convincing journals to, to move forward on this. Because there's something fundamentally incompatible about saying that an area is hypothesis driven but I'm unable to plan my methods and analyses before I see my data. Um, you can't really have it both ways. Either you're doing hypothesis-driven research and your hypothesis came before your analysis, or you're doing exploratory research and you're generating your hypothesis from your analysis. But the mixture between the two of, of say, being able to claim that you're testing hypotheses but somehow generating the hypotheses from the data, it's all very circular and very inferentially unsound. So there's strong arguments that um, for editors to adopt this and you know issues like workload and so on are always an issue but one of the arguments we often make to editors is that in fact in the long run this format um, should reduce the workload on reviewers because it reduces the rejection rate. Rejection rate is a huge factor for workload on reviewers because so many papers get sequentially submitted and rejected from multiple journals uh, and that means that a typical paper might go through 12, 15, even 20 reviewers before it gets published. Whereas with a registered report, there's perhaps a slightly more detailed review process initially, but there's a much higher chance of that protocol being accepted in the first journal where the author sends it to following peer review. So ultimately, as this format gets more popular, there'll be less of this submitting down the chain. So the workload issue should get reduced. I would say though that it is more work for editors because unlike normal, paper, normal papers, and, and most editors admittedly don't even bother reading papers that they edit, um, as a registered report editor, you, you know, you really do have to put the time in to read the papers properly and to, and to um, invest the effort that um, the, the authors are investing and the reviewers are investing. You have to match that as an editor. But these are, these are all, you know, reasons that we, that we use to motivate um, editors to promote this. So do let us know um, if there's a particular journal that you would like to see registered reports offered in and we will approach them and um, we'll let you know the outcome. Um, question here, my work isn't nutrition and memory, would pre-registration be appropriate? Um, I think the answers are resounding yes, you know, if, if you are yeah. testing hypotheses. Well, absolutely, so this comes back to my, the question, you know, is it appropriate in my field? And if you're testing hypotheses, if you report, if, 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 you're, if you're writing papers which say we predicted that, then you're testing a hypothesis. And, um, uh, in that, and if there's various forms of bias in the area, then definitely. I think there's definite, um, definite traction for the format. There is one nutrition journal so far. We haven't got a huge number of them. There is one nutrition journal that's offering registered reports. Um, and I think it's called NFS Journal. Um, and it's an area that we need more journals in. So again, I would say if there's a particular journal in your area that you would like to see adopt this format, um, please um, let us know and we'll approach them. Yeah, here's the NFS journal and um, here's a link to their guidelines for, yeah. I'll just paste this here. Which are very similar to the guidelines at Cortex. Yeah. And there you go. All right. Also, I would just say that um, there are a number of other journals which would publish work on nutrition and memory that aren't nutrition journals. So Royal Society of Open Science may well consider them. Um, even, if, you know, think about if you're doing work that is um, where the research question is very important and you're able to um, perform very robust methods, think about nature human behavior. Is there a generalist journal within that sort of broad scope of human behavior which is inviting registered reports across their entire range? So if you're doing work that's um, where the, the, the question itself is very important to address, um, I would um, strongly recommend considering them as an outlet. Yeah, the, 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 the benefit is so strong um, to you, the researcher, because it's um, you know, 
providing that really strong and rigorous peer review and improvement process at a point in the in the time where you can really you know take that advice and improve the research workflow um, and, and the biggest benefit is that you're, you're guaranteed a publication as long as you follow through with um, um, with the requirements making sure that the work is um, conducted to the level that was agreed upon and that is um, you know a huge benefit as opposed to playing the game as Chris said I think that's all the questions that have come through. So um, I want to thank everybody who's uh, um, online now. Again, if you Google, or actually I can just um, send the link right now where this will show up. Center for Open Science. So you'll see this. I'll make sure that an email goes out with that link. Um, but feel free to um, share that link around if you have other colleagues who want to see this webinar. Um, thank you, Chris, for your time. Um, and thank you, everyone who's um, stayed online. Thanks, everybody. Take care. All right, I'm going to stop recording.